Well, I'm blessed to be here. I've known Nick for quite a few years. Yeah. And as Nick said, I lead a national pro-life organization. It's called Bad Chaim, which simply means pro-life. And we have centers across Israel. And why do we have to do that? Because in Israel, we have national health insurance that covers abortions. And our government is paying for abortions. A woman has to go through a committee to have an abortion, yet the committee gives permission to 99.6% of the applicants. Mm -hmm. So it's a rubber stamp. Any woman in Israel who wants an abortion can have an abortion. Um, I'm, I'm sad and embarrassed to say that nobody in the Knesset is doing anything about it. The religious parties have increased the budget for abortion just this last December. Um, and so what do we want to do? We want to provide for the women an alternative to abortion. You know, in many places in the world, they say about abortion, they say that they're pro-choice, the people that are recommending abortion. Pro-choice. How can that be a choice if her boyfriend has told her, I'm going to leave you if you don't have an abortion? Mm -hmm. How is that a choice if her husband says, we don't have any money for another mouth? How is that a choice if she has 10 children and she's pregnant with number 11 and they live in two tiny rooms? Mm -hmm. How is that a choice? We give her the choice to keep the baby. What do I mean by that? I mean we provide everything that the mother needs for a full year for her baby. In um, Bat Chaim started in 1988 through prayer, and actually Barry and Batia were some of the people that were praying in 1988 to stop abortion. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I was kind of newly wedded. Yeah, they were among the ones who began Bat Chaim. That's right, and. Uh, Praying to stop abortion, they began with prayer and street outreach with tables and uh, saved a few babies and I had the advantage of coming in when there was Google. And what does that mean? That means that a woman who's just done a pregnancy test in the morning can type in abortion in Hebrew, of course it's all in Hebrew, and she'll find us and she'll be able to get help. And uh, we, when I joined, and well actually when I was asked to join Bat Chaim, I'm going to say this because this is important, because most Christians think abortion's wrong, but don't think they're the ones to do something about it. And that's exactly what I thought. And in 2005, a few people phoned me and said, would you be willing to take the job as director of Bat Chaim? And I said, no. As a matter of fact, one of the women said, take it, why don't you take it? And I said, why would I? You take it. She said, I have six children. I said, I have seven. I don't want this job. <laughs> and why? Because why would I want to talk about abortion when we can just say, Jesus loves you, go in peace, sister or brother. You know, like why? Who wants to talk about abortion? Nobody. But then I went for a meeting with the chairman of the board and he said, what's the deal? You don't, you, why are you coming? And I said, well, so many people urge me to meet you. I'll meet you. And uh, he said, you don't want the job. I said, no, I don't want to talk about abortion. I want to do, we were doing reconciliation between um, believing Palestinians and believing Israelis. I said, we want to do that. We want to help other people. We want to, you know, evangelize. I don't want to do that. And he looked at me and he said, you love Israel? I said, I love Israel. He said, then there's nothing that God hates more than the shedding of innocent blood. And if you want to see Israel blessed, you're going to have to stop the shedding of innocent blood. Mm -hmm. But he didn't exactly persuade me, but he gave me books and DVDs. And he said, come back in one month and say what the Holy Spirit had said. One month later, the Holy Spirit had spoken to my heart. First of all, I know when Barry and Batia were among those who began Bat Chaim, it was one, two, three, four is abortion. Now our population went since then from the three million, it's now nine and a half million. It's not one, two, three, four aborted, but it's probably something like one, two, something between sixth and eighth pregnancy and abortion. And I knew that. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Proverbs 24, 11 and 12, rescue those being led to slaughter. Deliver those being brought to their death. Oh, hold them back. Do not say you do not know, because the Lord will render to each one according to what he's done. The Lord weighs your heart, and he renders to you what you've done. And the Lord gave me a picture of myself like an ostrich and said, now, choose. You can put your head in the sand and say you don't know, or you can do something about it. And I fervently believe that anybody can do anything about any evil in this world. You know, when Jesus, Yeshua, said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. I mean, I suppose he was also speaking about personal grief, but I think primarily he was talking about what Ezekiel in chapter 9, verse 4 says. He says, send out the cherub through Jerusalem and put a mark on the head of those who weep and mourn over the abominations done in this city. And I believe that we need to be the ones weeping and mourning over the abominations done in our country and here in Israel. 
And, you know, Mother Teresa said something very interesting. She said, we should not be surprised when the enemy kills our children when we ourselves are killing our own children. I'm sorry, but the word says in Deuteronomy, if you choose life, you'll have a blessing and live long on the land. That's the word in Deuteronomy. You want to have blessing, you want to live long, you want to have fulfillment, choose life. That's what the word says. This is our option. But we want to give people the choice of life. So, of course, if the Holy Spirit said to me, choose, do you want to do something or not do something? Do you want to be an ostrich or not? And do you remember right now we're celebrating in Israel the holiday of Purim? You know the holiday of Purim? The book of Esther? And do you remember when Mordecai, I say in Hebrew Mordecai, but I know you say Mordecai. But when Mordecai went to Esther and he said to her, Esther, there's a decree to kill all of our people. And she said, what, what do you want me to do? I could be killed. Why are you telling me? And he said, listen up. If you choose to do something to save the people or not, God will save them. The question is, do you want to be a part of what God is doing? That's the question. Well, she answered rightly, didn't she? So in 2005, I joined Bad Chaim. We were saving a couple of babies a year because it was difficult. The chairman of the board, Tony, told me to go out and give out flyers. I know they had been giving them out slowly, but you might notice that I'm a bit hyperactive. And so I decided I'm not going to just stand at a table. I'm going to give them out like potato chips. Mm -hmm. So I had partners, and we would pray, and we took piles of flyers, and we just went like that. At the bus station, we gave out half a million flyers. Wow. And I only know about nine babies we saved, but I'm sure we saved more. But that year, I went to speak in an English-speaking church in, I say church because here we have Hebrew-speaking congregations. But I went to speak in an English-speaking church in Tel Aviv near the old bus station where it was all refugees and foreign workers. And I'm thinking, why am I here? And then the pastor said, we want to do something. We want to do more than just pray. We want to start a project for you. And together we designed the name Operation Moses because Moses' mother put the baby in the river. And that mother watched God provide for her child through Pharaoh's daughter, really the only person in all of Egypt that could have saved the baby. Anybody else would have been killed for saving a Hebrew baby, right? She had the power, the affluence, and the ability to save that child. Mm -hmm. And so our project, Project Moses, Operation Moses, provides everything a mother needs for a full year for her baby. And it's kind of like UNICEF. It's a sponsorship program where people around the world sponsor a baby, a church, a group, whatever. Sponsor a baby for a full year. They get a letter about the baby at birth and a letter about the baby at the end of the year about the baby and mother, you know, their family, so you can pray. And usually a photograph, if the mother allows us to send one, so you can be a prayerful part of that baby's life. And I'll show you, we give a, we send out a certificate to um, anybody who sponsored a baby with the baby's birth date and name. So you're part of that person's life and that family's life. And the women find us, people usually ask me, the women find us on Google mostly on Facebook. Well, praise God. There's a lot of bad things about the internet, but there's a lot of great things about the internet, and that's how they find us. Or during, during um, Corona, we had people from all over the world just wanted to support, praise the Lord. And so we were able to advertise big time. We put up giant wall-sized billboards on the Tel Aviv Jerusalem Highway five times. And we put up 450 buses all over Israel for a full year. We had radio advertising in the Army uh, radio which I was so thrilled about. I thought they wouldn't let me, and they let me go on the Army radio because the Army provides free medical, free abortions for women. So, you know, we were able to advertise all over the country. And uh, last year, we had 750 births of babies. We have now about 200 women that are pregnant. And this project, since 2005, has saved about 5,000 lives. And it, it provides for the mother the bed, the stroller, the bathtub, the bed sheets. And every single month, a gift card for more than $100 a month for a year. So she can do what she wants to help her baby. And I know in South Africa, I can only imagine if you could provide for a poor mother, how many wouldn't abort, I realize. And I, but I can say, and I don't know if you would see it as tourists, but there are many, many poor Israelis. And many times they want to abort because they feel like they can't provide. But today, today, you know, I've been doing this since 2005, and I don't usually... I, was like, I cry when I see something evil, and I cry when I see something beautiful. But today, I, I, like I say, we've saved almost 5,000. A woman came in that made me absolutely start to weep. A 22-year-old mother came in 
with a newborn, three months. She came in with her 14-year-old sister. She's um, ultra-Orthodox. So they have 10 children and her, uh, her siblings, she and her siblings. And uh, I asked her, I said, so tell me, I was sitting next to her, we were having a little Purim party in her office, and I said, why didn't you abort? And she said, uh, it was an interesting story. She said, I, I, uh, I knew that it was a person. I just knew that there was a developing human being inside me. And I said, really, you're so young. And she said, yeah, I knew that, that it was a developing person. And she said, I went to my rabbi. See, the Orthodox will go to the rabbis to ask permission. And, she, and the rabbi would allow permission. He said, it's permissible to abort until the 40th day of pregnancy. It's permissible. And she said to him, well, maybe it's permissible, but I can't do it. I know I have a developing human being inside me. I can't do it. And then she showed me a picture of her baby. And this is a... Um, this is a, a white woman, uh, her family's from um, Eastern Europe. And uh, I say that because, and she said, and the man who impregnated me is Ethiopian. And um, I'm, I'm telling you this, she said, everybody told me to abort. And I then went out of the room for a minute and my counselor whispered to me, this is why I started crying, I couldn't believe it. My counselor whispered to me, she went to a party and she was drinking and uh, <sighs> The man put a, a drug in her drink mm -hmm. and raped her. Oh. And this woman decided not to abort. Well. I, could, I mean, I was, I, I just hugged her. I, I gave her a special gift. I said, I, you are the bravest person I've, I think I've ever met of the 5,000 women, you know? Like, what a gal. And we were talking, and I said, you must be, she's living in the ultra-Orthodox community. I said, you must be so... Uh, it's a difficult situation. She said, my parents were utterly ashamed. They told me to abort. And the man actually gave her the morning after pill, but it didn't work. And he, you know, the, after they, yeah, mm -hmm. she thought it was aspirin. She didn't know what he'd given her. Later, she realized. And she said, um, I just couldn't do it no matter what. I just could not abort that child. Mm -hmm. What a woman. Sometimes we see such heroes in her office, just the most amazing people. You know, sometimes people just are terrified. They don't have the money, they can't afford it, and they just need a loving, listening ear. And we have counselors all over Israel. We have offices all through Israel now. Um, we have 20 counselors. We're all the way in Haifa and Tiberias and Tel Aviv and Beersheba and Eilat in Jerusalem and all over the place so that we can be there for the women. They call the hotline and they get a counselor who cares and loves them. And then they're offered help through Operation Moses Project. So what we're offering is three things. Hope, practical help through the project, and healing. And we do a really, um, I think it's a very important job of helping people who have lost a baby, any reproductive loss, either abortion, miscarriage, or stillbirth. And we counsel them. We have a psychologist on our staff. We have several workbooks, some for Orthodox, some for believers, some for secular, and we help people work through the pain, the guilt, the shame. And we also have something very special, and you're all welcome to participate. There's a place called the Gardens of Life. I don't know if you use acres. Do you talk acres? Yeah. So we have four acres of land in the, we could say the belly button, in the middle of Israel, equal in Latrun, right between north-south and east-west, right there in Latrun, which is biblically Emmaus, where trees are planted in memory of babies that died. And this place is a place of healing for many because they've never had closure. And I'll just conclude with, because um, I, I, I see you have to get to Ben Yehuda. So I'll tell you um, a little story. There was a woman from um, Switzerland. She had had an abortion in April. And she had what they call a chemical abortion. That means she took two pills, and then it causes uh, contractions and like she, the baby, like a miscarriage. And so she, that happened at home. And she had the remains of the baby, the blood, and the little tiny, like the size of a little tiny fingernail. And she took this and she kept it in a cloth, and she slept with this under her pillow. She was a Catholic woman, and she felt so guilty. She kept going to the priest and confessing. 
She confessed and she felt terrible, but she never received the love and forgiveness. She never received it. She couldn't understand that she could be forgiven. And so she had this cloth under her bed and she was crying herself to sleep every night. And this precious woman finally looked on Google in the fall in October and she clicked help after abortion and she found us. I couldn't believe she did this, but she flew to Israel for this. And she phoned me in the office and she said, I need to plant a tree in the garden. Can I come? And that was a Thursday. I said, come on Sunday because we don't work on Friday and Saturday. And then she came on su Sunday and um, we planted the, the cloth under the tree. And we shared that the Lord forgave her sin, that she was clean, that she was free, that she was over. It was done. What Jesus did on the cross, on his tree, he took all the guilt and shame. And that was it. And that woman received the Lord in the sense that she received that he had died and risen for her and given her new life, not just guilt and shame, but freedom and release and healing. And she later texted me and said, it's over. I have no more guilt. And this is the reason we have the garden. And sometimes it may be even a miscarriage or a stillbirth, but people are carrying so much lack of closure in their hearts. And so people from anywhere can write our office, say, We'd like, I'd like you to plant a tree for me. It's $30 to plant a tree. It's not a big deal. We just pay for the cost of the tree. Plant a tree for me, and we get a very beautiful certificate where you can put the baby's name. The other day I met with a few women from uh, I don't know, the U.S., I guess, and they had me plant trees just for wayward grandchildren and you know it's just a place of healing a place where you feel a loss and God wants to bring healing into your life so hope practical help and healing that's what we want to do and that's our purpose and we're not just we're not against abortion we're pro women and pro babies and pro God the love of God is what sets us free. And I just urge you, wherever you are, you know, you can always do something. No matter what it is, there just may be a single mother who's all alone. You can help her. You can support her. There may be some young girl who just needs somebody to show her how to nurse her baby or care for her. Or it could be anything. I also want to just thank you for the stuff you've brought. It's beautiful. And uh, this, please, I think there's one for everybody. Take them. Just take them. And have them. We just want to bless you. Thank okay? You so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, uh.